I'm Keith Olson, and I'm from the Clinical Organizational Development Department. I work primarily as a coach to our physicians. I'm very pleased to be here for the first pep talk that we've done here as part of COD. Um, and I want to get started right away, but I was told I should wait about five minutes. But the irony of starting a time management program five minutes late was <laughs> overwhelming. But I've done this program for programs like this for many, many years, and it, I was always struck that the program that I do that has the most people late to is time management. So I started to view that and frame that as they're in the right place, right, when they showed up late. Um, so there was this guy who was totally overworked. He worked harder and harder and harder, and he just felt more and more behind. And he'd come into his office, and his desk was full of paper and piles. They were supposed to remind him of stuff to do. And he had post-it notes all over to remind him of stuff to do. And he'd look at it, and it would just be overwhelming. And he'd be so stressed out. And he would just feel he had to work later to catch up. And he'd go home, and he'd still be stressed out. And he'd have trouble sleeping. And his whole life was really being affected by this. Have you ever seen anyone like that? <laughs> Maybe in the mirror? I spend my time coaching physicians. There are physicians I coach who I see that with them. And they are very successful people, but they're overwhelmed. And they're stressed out. And they're not finding the time to do the important things, like publish research that they should be doing. They're feeling more and more pressure with that. But that guy is not one of those physicians. Uh, that guy was me 25 years ago. And that was very much a vivid picture of what my life was back then. So I made it a point of trying to get a handle on time and my life. And I read a ton of material on time management. And I read all kinds of books. So I'm going to save you from reading all those books. And because there's interesting concepts that are too complicated sometimes to do in the real world. These A lists and B lists. And if anyone's tried anything like that, you know about six months later, you're not doing those things. So everything I'm sharing with you today, I've done for at least two decades. And I'm sharing things with you today that I know have helped the clients that I coach uh, not have a life like I described and have one where they're more productive in less time and with a lot less stress. And they have a better life because of it. Because what we're talking about here with time is our life. This last quote that just went up, begin with the end in mind, by Stephen Covey. Has anyone ever read Seven Habits of Highly Effective People here? All right, so you, you recognize this is one of those seven habits. For those of you who aren't familiar with the book, the book was written by Stephen Covey where he looked at people who were very effective and successful in life. And he tried to look at what they had in common. One of those things they had in common is they really had a sense of the end. They kept the end in mind. And by end, he's talking about the end of our lives. Everyone, I know this isn't news to you, but everyone in this room is going to die someday. All right? And hopefully it's decades from now, right? Could be tomorrow. None of us know that. But this thing we call time is our life. I mean, I just was coaching someone this morning who was a little upset because he had lost a large sum of money. And then he, at the end he said, you know, I, I'll make it back. And if we waste time or we waste money, it's a very different thing. If we waste money, we can make it back. If we waste time, it's gone forever. We can't buy more time. We can't work to get more time. There's this finite period between when we're born and when we die. So that precious thing that we call time, I want you to picture for a second. When I do a two-hour program on this, one of the exercises I ask people to do is take a circle like this and make a pie chart. You're on your last day on Earth and make a pie chart of what you're really going to be focused on thinking about. What do you think they put in that pie chart? Family. 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 Absolutely. What else? Uh, what? Travel. Travel. Got it. It's like I planted you guys in the audience here. <laughs> it's real. I've been doing this for years. I've seen hundreds of these pie charts last day. Many of them are one big slice. Family, people I love. The second slice, if they have one, is a narrow one. It's experiences or travel. That's what most of them look like. So then I asked them to do a second pie chart. 
And in this pie chart, I want them to take their, I don't know what happened to, oh. I want them to take their normal week and make a pie chart on how they spend their time. And what's in that pie chart? Work. Work. <laughs> what else is in that pie chart? Commuting. Commuting. What else is in that pie chart? What else? <laughs> Errands, kids, stuff, obligations like that. Well, that's all important stuff. We need those to do those things. But there's, there's other reasons why we're not spending time on what's really in the end going to be important to us. And I'll tell you, from my experience working with and coaching people, it's disorganization, it's perfectionism, it's guilt, it's a feeling of obligation beyond what's really needed. It's multitasking, which we'll talk about. All of this causes those circles to be more different than they should be. So there's four practices up here. They're very simple. You'll read through these. You're like, I came all the way down here for these four simple practices. But this is, these practices have had a huge impact in my life and the people I coach. And they're pretty simple practices. Those of you who are taking notes, they're on the sheet that's on your chair. So I don't want you to worry about that. We're going to get back to that sheet in a little bit. So let's take the first of these practices. Managing by the week. This came from Stephen Covey's book, First Things First. And it seems very simple. Why is, but it, it can be very impactful. When we think about managing for a week, we can accomplish certain tasks in the rough and tumble weeks that we have. When I've seen time management systems and when I've tried them, where we're trying to manage each day perfectly, they're very discouraging. Has anyone tried those kind of time management approaches? You just give up after a while. But Monday morning, I come into work, I get my coffee, the computer's coming up, and I think to myself, what's the most important things I can do and accomplish this week? What do I have to get out of this week, both in my personal life and my professional life? Then I block out time in my calendar if there isn't already time for those. Because some of those will be on part of task forces or meetings. There's already an appointment for that. But if there isn't, I'm making an appointment with myself to accomplish that task. I learned over time this was very helpful, but I feel really cocky and good on a Friday afternoon thinking, well, that was a great week. I got everything done. And I'd look and notice the budget was due on Monday. And there goes my whole weekend, right? So I do a rolling two-week look. What do I have to get out of this week, block out time for it, and then I look ahead to the next week? And that's how I start every week. So I have a sense of what I'm going to focus on. Now, those blocks of time are incredibly precious. And we need to make them as productive as possible. Of all the things I'm going to talk about today, to me, this is one of the most impactful concepts. Deep work versus shallow work. Shallow work is what we do to keep our jobs. We answer emails, we go to meetings, we write reports, right? That's what we spend, we probably spend most of our week in shallow work. Deep work is the work that gets us promoted. Deep work is the work that takes us a big step forward and helps us have an impact, or solve big problems, or simplify things on units, or, or solve patient care and safety issues. And we tend not to book and focus our time on doing deep work. So that's why those blocks of time are so important. When we're in a state of doing deep work, our productivity zooms. You've all experienced this at some point. You had a paper to do in college, or you had some other activity, and you sat down in your apartment, and you sat down, and you're like, oh, you know what, let me finish that one conversation. You get up. And you sit down, and you're like, you know, I, let me get some coffee. And you get up, all right? And you sit down, and you're like, you know, PBJ would be really good with this right now, right? And you sit down, and you start struggling with those first few words, and they're hard. And, and about 20 minutes later, you start getting the state of flow. Has anyone ever experienced that? And your productivity just rockets. And the problem is, most of us structure our days where we can never get in a state of flow. We have a little half hour, 15 minute periods we're trying to do something really deep and important that takes concentration. We need more time to get in that state of flow. It's a, it's a really impactful thing. When you, 
when Yo-Yo Ma or Eric Clapton are going to perform, they're backstage doing scales. Does Eric Clapton really need to practice scales on his guitar? No. He's doing it to settle his mind in, and get rid of the distractions and settle into this task he's going to do. There's a concept called attention residue. Whenever we move from one task to another, from one meeting to another, from one person to another, in our brain there's the residue of the previous meeting, the previous task, and still resonating. That's what's happening in those 20 minutes when you're struggling to get started with something. We can do some practices that help us get past that period faster. So my computer in my office makes no sound. So you have that little volume thing, I put it on zero. Only time it makes sound is when I'm reviewing a videotape for work that someone needs me to look at. Second thing is I removed is that little thing that comes up that reminds me there's a new email. I do this because I'm too weak a person to resist those things, right? I know that, right? Like, I bet that's really interesting. Far more interesting than this important task I've got to do. So I turn those off. And when I had to prepare this presentation, put together this PowerPoint, I designated a deep work period on my schedule. I, those things are already off on my, in my office. I pulled out my iPhone. How many people have iPhones here? You know that little half moon thing that you do not disturb? You can program so people important to you need to call you, can get through, but otherwise your phone goes silent. I put on do not disturb, and then I put on the timer a 50 minute period. So I don't have to look at my watch or clock or wonder how close I'm getting to the next period that I have to go to something. Even if I have a two hour block, I tend to do 50 minute periods of deep work. Because in those 50 minutes, that takes a lot of concentration. And if, we, if at the end of those 50 minutes we take a little breather and a little break, get some water and come back, we can restart another 50 minutes. If you're in a role where it's hard to get that kind of time isolated, work with someone in your area to help pair off and do that. Back in my consulting days, it was a very demanding business, a lot of clients calling all the time, but if I had to do deep work to get together material for a presentation, I'd tell my partner or colleague, you know, can you handle everything from UPMC coming, coming in today? I need this period of deep work. So you work with someone to provide that for you. And so now you're in the state where you're getting, you know, like hyper productivity. You can get more done in an hour of deep work than you can in four or five half hours spread out during the day. Has anyone here ever heard of uh, Adam Grant? Anyone? Right. Adam Grant is a full professor at Wharton School of Business. Full professor at age 35. All right, yeah, those of you who know academic, that might take to 50s or 60s to get. And he's a full professor at age 35 <coughs> because he publishes seven, five, six, seven articles every year in the most elite journals in his field. Right. That's astronomical. Right. And he's published two New York Times bestsellers while he was doing all that. And he has TED Talks and other Googles invited him to talk. And he has a, ha you know, a wife and a spouse and a life. He's an amateur magician. And he was the top rated teacher at Wharton School of Business. And his colleagues are like, how do you do this? Deep work. He says, it's my only secret. It's the only thing I do different than the rest of you. I get blocks of time, and I do huge volumes of work in those blocks of time. So I, I, this to me is one of the most impactful things you can do. Inherent is this, is something that I'm gonna, you're, hopefully you'll leave today knowing that there's something you can do that will increase your productivity 20 to 30% and reduce your stress. Isn't that going to be great to know? Stop doing this. Stop multitasking. We got sold this thing that we can multitask. The evidence is, we're not going to argue it. It's, you know, it's abundant. There's no counter evidence to it. University of Michigan had people do three tasks. Task A, task B, task C. And then they had another group do the same exact tasks, but they alternated A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. Like most of us work, right? Going like that, right? 
That second group took 30% longer to do the exact same work of the other group. And they made more errors. 30% longer. That's an, an eight hour day is now a 10 hour day. A 10 hour day is now a 13 hour day. Simply by multitasking. UCLA looked at the effects of people who multitask all the time. Not only do they have higher levels of stress hormones in their body, their short term memory is depleted. You'll, from today on, you'll notice those, there are days we all have to multitask sometimes. The days you have to do a lot of that, you're going to go home and talk to someone and say, God, so-and-so, what's their name? Or what was the name of that restaurant? I forgot the name of that restaurant. I mean, I thought I was just getting older. <laughs> it might be a little of that. Right? <laughs> but it was the days I multitasked. Right? University of London did an experiment where they had one group smoke marijuana, another group stay up all night, and another group did a very simple multitasking thing. You've all done this, probably. You're answering the phone, and you're finishing an email. Has anyone done that? And chances are, when you did like, oh my god, did I CC everyone on that? <laughs> it was because you were multitasking, right? They did before and after IQ tests in those three groups. That last group reduced their IQ, that simple multitasking, just one event of that, reduced their IQ 10 points on the subsequent test. The people stayed up all night, 10 points. The marijuana smokers, 5 points. There's a moral in there somewhere, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I often wonder like, how they get the volunteers for the various groups with this, right? <laughs> so I, there was a professor at Stanford who was convinced, you know what? That's all great, all you other universities. But I know there's people who can multitask. I'm going to find them. So he had people self-identify as great multitaskers. And then he had their peers confirm, you know, yeah, they're known for their multitasking. And he had them come in and do these baseline cognitive tests that this control group did. And he stopped the experiment because they were so mushy-brained and terrible at these things. He was appalled. Right. No group, not young, not old, not male, not female, is our brains are unitasking brains. Whenever we switch from one task to another, that remember I talked about attention residue, that's what's adding the time. That's what's adding the confusion. So when you can be a proud unitasker, and that means doing things like, you know what, let me get back to you on that. I'm really focused on finishing this right now. Stopping trying to think that you're a superhuman and can do this, you'll find your productivity increases significantly. This is a quote from someone who came to my office about 10 years ago. So a young leader who I knew, when I heard she was promoted here, I thought, that's fantastic. She has everything it takes to be a great leader. She's going to be great. And I was anxious. She wanted to meet with me. I'm like, oh, this would be great. And then she sits down. She goes, I'm going to give up this leadership role. I'm like, whoa, why? I can't do it. Of course you can do it. You're going to be great at this. I can't do it. Why? Because there's all these fires all the time, things going on that are disrupting my day. And I just can't do my job. I said, that is your job. That is your job. And we called up her schedule. And she had eight hours of meetings every day. And I said, you've got to expect that things will go wrong, that people will do stupid things, that people won't show up. That's just the nature of people and organizations. So part of time management is accepting that, to realize that if you don't have time in your schedule to absorb people and organizational faux pas and things going wrong, you'll be totally stressed. There's a, there was a division head I was coaching a few years ago, and he thought he'd lead by example. I'll be the highest producing division, I mean, person in my area that'll inspire. I go, that's not your job anymore. And I said, you need to build in cushions of time. You, you can't be in the OR and clinic and doing all these other meetings without some cushions in time. This is a reason this third practice is a really important one. You want to get to your big, deep task early in the week early in the day before stuff goes wrong. That's one reason to do it. Because your week's going to go out of control. It is. Accept it. So Monday morning and in the morning, you want to be focused on the stuff that really makes a difference. One practice I have is thinking about my MIT every day. What's the most important task today? So I'll come in in the morning. I'll have my coffee. I'll look at my email. I'll get rid of the garbage, which is half of it, right? 
And then I'll look for my boss's name, so Diane will be pleased to hear that. <laughs> I'll look for any of the clients I'm coaching, make sure there's not a change in the meeting, and then I stop looking at email. Because that first hour is precious. And I think about the most important thing I can do. Think about this, if you were a runner running a race and you knew there was a steep incline that you had to climb up in that race, would you want it early in the race? Or would you want it when you're tired? Why do we think mentally we're different? I've coached people to say, you know what, I just wait till everyone's gone, and then I do this really important stuff. And how's that working for you? I don't know, I'm just mush-brained and exhausted by that. Of course you are, you're human. So not only does starting early in the week and early in the day help us with the fact that our days are gonna careen out of control, and that's normal, it helps us work when we're really at our best and able to do that work. And that, that kind of focus during that period is very easy. It gets much harder late at night. If you think your day is endless, it will be endless. You know, if you work with an end point in mind that I'm gonna leave at a certain time, you will work differently. I was coaching someone a couple of years ago, and unfortunately I coach people sometimes, their, their, their work style, their stress, their, their long hours are affecting their home life. And I remember this one gentleman saying, you know, I'm really getting a lot of flack at home, I'm here all the time, I really not need to get a handle on this. And I, I remembered that he had gone to Cincinnati to do a presentation the previous week. And he had to leave at five o'clock to get to the airport to fly to Cincinnati. And I said to him, I bet when you came in that day, you worked differently the whole day. That you came in and there were conversations that you just didn't get involved in. And there were tasks that you said, you know what, I'll let so-and-so do it, I'll let it go. You know, tame the perfectionist here. And there are things that you said, you know what, I gotta really focus here get this done because I'm leaving at 5 o'clock. And he, he lives in the suburbs. I said, you need to pretend that there's a 5 o'clock plane at Union Station every day. And you work differently with an end in mind. And when you have an end in mind, you've got to make it a true end, too. So at the end of the day, it's not like, you know, I say, you pick the time. He says, OK, 5.30. I go, it doesn't mean like a bell goes off and you bolt out and leave loose ends, all right? That doesn't work because your head then is spinning. But at the end of every day, what I do is think, I look at my calendar. What did I do? What didn't I do? What do I need to plan time for in the next few days to get to? Conversations that I need to follow up on, whatever. And I'm just making that plan at the end of the day, three minutes, two minutes, clears your head. Does anyone have the phenomenon, you wake up in the middle of the night, it's two in the morning, something from work bubbles up, Right? I'm going to get a lot of looks of recognition of this. And he can't go to sleep then, right? So someone told me years ago this trick that seems to, I think, work pretty well. Have a pad of paper and pencil in your drawer, you know, by your drawer, write it down, and then it goes away because your mind is not focused on it anymore. You know, sometimes you look at it in the morning, you're like, I was laying awake over this, or, <laughs> or, or what does this say, okay? But you were able to get back to sleep. It's the same thing when you leave work. Being able to go home and refresh yourself and build that resiliency. And our next program that we're going to have in November is on resiliency. It's all about this. So which desk is yours? How many people's desk looks more like the one on the left? You don't have to be ashamed. It's OK. <laughs> How many looks like on the right? All right that's pretty good. Mine, 25 years ago, looked like the one on the left. Okay. Now it looks like the one on the right. It doesn't have the nice plant, um, but, but it's close to that. Those of you who worked with me for a long time know it's kind of spooky. You know, what does Keith do? There's like this one thing on his desk. You know, does he really have a job? Like, what's... Whatever I'm working on is what's on my desk. I don't use my desk as a tickler or a reminder. And we've all had that, those, and I used to do that. And I'd pick up this pile and I'm like, oh my God, that's due too, you know? <laughs> Where was that hiding, right? That's not fun at all. Here's a very simple process that I use and um, have been using for about two decades now. So I mentioned, I'll scan my email in the morning for my boss's names. I'll scan for my clients that day. And then I get to work on the most important thing. So maybe it's 11.30, I'm gonna look at the rest of those emails. 
You send me an email saying, Keith, I went to that time management program, but I lost that sheet of paper you had. Can you send it to me? Sure, done. All right? Takes a few minutes. Got to find it, attach it to your email, it's done. I'm going to do that. I'm not going to spend time on those things I can do quickly. If you email me, though, and you say, you know, I really liked that part you had about email, and I would love for you to do a presentation at our staff meeting. Now, this involves me putting together some slides and material. So what I do is I take that, I drag it to a folder with your name or department's name on it, and I make an appointment on my calendar to do that work. I'm not keeping it in my inbox or on my desk as a reminder. It's a very simple process. The only difference from my desk and email is if I'm going to get to it later that day, I'll keep it in my inbox. And I'll talk about email in a few minutes. So that's the process of triaging this, that I'm not using a desk or email as a tickler, and I'm having things on my calendar. Now, I will tell you, for 20 years, I used a single to-do list, and that works incredibly well. And I was a big fan of a single to-do list. Four years ago, when I started coaching surgeons, they'd say, Keith, I'm in scrubs, I'm in the OR, I'm not carrying around a to-do list. So we tried various apps on their phones, because they have their phones with, and they weren't working as well. So we tried something, and I tried it with them. Let's use our calendars. It's synced, it'll always be there wherever you go, and let's make the appointments. And I have now abandoned my single to-do list and used the calendar, but either one works fine. The idea is that you're not using your desk as a tickler. I've had people I've coached who said, I know this has saved me some time looking for stuff. Those of you who have desks who look, who look like that left-hand one know that you're looking for stuff quite a bit. That's all time in the wrong circle, right? Going back to our original story and example. They said, I know it saved me some time, but what it's really saved me is anxiety and stress. I feel like my desk isn't yelling at me anymore. All right? And that's what I felt when I started doing this, too. So email. I mentioned... <laughs> or evil mail, right? Here's my first two rules of thumb about email. If you would be embarrassed if that email were on the front page of the New York Times or Tribune, do not use email. Email is always potentially public. I mean, you need to accept that. If, if you email me and, and you say, you know what, I attended that session you were at, and I forgot I shouldn't have put that in email because I mentioned so-and-so and I was really mad at them, and can you delete it? I delete it, and you delete it. And then a person whose name is in there ends up suing Larry Children's. And we get a subpoena that says, give us all the emails that ever mentioned this person. Delete it or not, they're getting those emails. Right? Emails can be forwarded. So so-and-so's brother-in-law works for the Sun-Times. Now it's on the front page of the Sun-Times, right? Emails can be hacked by Russians, apparently. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Email is always potentially public. So that's the first test. If this were public, would embarrass me? It's not an email. It's a call. It's a discussion. It's an in-person meeting. Second test is if there's emotional content to it. That should be a call or a personal meeting. It'll be a waste of time to try to express emotions back and forth. Because you'll spend a lot of time. I, every week goes by, I'm coaching someone how to untangle the misuse of email. Because they put things in email that really should have been in conversation. Debating issues. What a waste of time is. What does everyone think of this? And everyone's composing their Nobel laureate response, <laughs> trying to impress all their colleagues. And by the time they send it off, it's changed directions, right? You know, my rule of thumb is if I see the subject three times in my email box, my response is usually a meeting invite. Or let's just get together and talk about this. Right. I try to touch email once. If I can respond right away, great. If not, I drag it to a folder. Whatever folder system works, think about where your brain goes. For me, because my world has always been clients and customers, I, all my folders in my Outlook are clients and customers' names. So they're going to be individual physicians I coach or departments I work with, and that's it. Others are real project-oriented. So just stick to something. Everything I do, whether it's an electronic file or a paper file, has name of client, topic, date. And it's very simple. My, my, my folders are kind of crude looking. They look like a kid drew them sometimes, but they're consistent, and I can find them. So I get about 1,500, 1,500 emails a week. 
I think most of you probably get something like that. And I mentioned earlier that I try to get everything out of my email box. And my email box, by the end of the typical week, is usually at zero. And that some people are like, I'm inducing heart attacks here. <laughs> we, have a, we have a crash cart on the floor, I think, if we need to do this, all right? <laughs> but if you use this method, you can get to that. But getting over the hump to get to that, that's the hard part. I was coaching someone a few months ago who had 8,000 emails in their inbox. They're like, Keith, I don't even know where to start. I go, well, here's where we're going to start. Everything that's within this month, we're keeping. Everything that's longer than a month old, we're dragging to a folder. We're going to call it archive. And I'm going to bet a cup, a cup of coffee at that mile north where they have the intelligentsia with you that you will never go in that archive folder. And I've never lost that bet with anyone I coach. All right? Just dra somehow it all just kind of magically took care of itself or went away in that. And then I said, we're going to block out two or three hours, get you out over the hump here, and we're going to go through that month's worth of email. The triaging I use when I go on vacation, I come back. When I go on vacation, I plan those days off and, this is really important, and the next morning. So many of us will plan the days off, and we're good about that, and then we come back and there's no block of time to settle in and tackle your email. It's just really important to do that. And I come in, I look at these 1,500 emails, I take a deep breath, I try to remember wherever I was at and how much I enjoyed it, and then I sort by sender. When you sort by sender, you can get rid of a lot of garbage and stuff that's history. New York Times updates from a week ago, that's history. Get rid of it, all right? And I look for, again, anything with my boss's names on it. <laughs> and then I, I look, I sort by topic. And when I sort by topic, I look at the last email in every topic. You've all had this experience. You come back, you start reading the email trail, and you're reading 15 minutes of emails, and it's solved. And you're like, well, that was a waste of time. <laughs> Read the last one on every topic. I can get down from 1,500 to 300, that method, within half hour. Now I've got a block of time to plow through those others. And the same kind of triaging methodology. I hate to bring up high school physics, because it's kind of a bad repressed memory for most of us. But there's something we all learned in high school physics. And that's a formula that was energy is the capacity to produce work. Right? And we need high energy to do the hard jobs that we have. Everyone in this room has a very challenging job. I know you have the experience of describing what happens in this building to people who don't work here. And they're like, wow, that's serious stuff. Yeah, it is. These are hard jobs. We need resiliency, energy to do these jobs well. And so we need to do these things that help build our energy. I'm a huge believer, and the people I coach, they know I'm on them all the time, to disconnect, to disconnect when you leave for the day. You know, those of you who check email on Sunday nights, I know I've had the experience of them being up all night because someone ticked you off, right? There is no upside to doing it. If you really feel like you need to get a jump on a day on Sunday night, then come in early. But don't ruin your whole Sunday because of that. I just, I have so many friends that have that practice. And they'll call me and say, I can't believe it. I go, you can't do anything about this. No one's in the office. What was the upside of looking at this email at this time? So there are certain things that we know we're not going to argue. The evidence is abundant. And you'll learn more about these at our next session. But there's certain things we know that build our energy and our resilience. I've got huge hints on this page. What are they? Sleep. At least seven hours sleep. I read a study. It was really interesting. There is about 2% of the population that can get by on less than seven hours sleep. The problem is about 30% of Americans think they're part of that 2%. <laughs> we need sleep. All right. We're better for it. We have better energy. We think more clearly with this. What else is up there? Exercise. You want to increase your energy? Exercise. You want to lower your stress? Exercise. I know there are times where I just have to run because it's like mentally good for everyone around me <laughs> if I do that, right? What else is up there? 
Drinking water. So this building, how many people, when you moved in this building, about 3 o'clock you felt drugged? You're like, what is happening with me, right? <laughs> this building is dry, because it has to be, all right? We're a hospital in that. Drinking at least six or eight, carrying around the water that most of us carry around. There's some water back there. Really important. What else? Hobbies. All right, so that picture's up there. I, I do think it would be a better world if we all played guitar. But I'm not saying we all have to play guitar, all right? It's having something immersive. It, really interesting research at Harvard. They gave iPhone apps to 15,000 Americans who were pinged periodically throughout the day. And when they were pinged, they had to answer three questions. One was a pull-down menu of all possible activities. What are you doing right now? Second was a scale in terms of how in the moment are you? Are you thinking about the past, worried about the future, or are you totally immersed in what you're doing? And the third one was a simple scale, how happy are you? And what they found was happiness correlated very little with activity. We think when we're on vacation we're happy, but maybe we're not, right? Because we're preoccupied with other things. We think we're at work, we're, they're paying us to be here because it's not always fun all the time, but sometimes we're totally engrossed in what we're doing. What correlated hugely with happiness was being in the moment. That's why getting back to deep work, what's great about it, when you are really in deep work and you're doing something and taking a big step forward in a project that was hard and you're engrossed in it, it feels good. You have those days, you come home, you're like, I had a really good day today. My guess is you had a deep work period during it and it felt good. So having an immersive hobby is really, really important. What have we missed here? Meditation, all right, mindfulness. We all know the evidence, that's why we have it here on Tuesdays. We all know the evidence of the impact it has on lowering stress and blood pressure and the health benefits. For me, what the big benefit is, it builds the concentration muscle, the ability to focus. So those of you who try, decide to try this deep work, so many of you will be frustrated at first because we're, we have these, these things on us all the time. The whole world and the internet is in here. And it's always more fascinating than the hard work we have to do, right? It's like candy for our mind, right? <laughs> and it's about as nourishing as that. It's depleting our ability to, to concentrate. And I, I'm not a technophobe. I love technology. I love my Apple products and that. But we need to recognize we need to build our ability to focus again. And so meta mindfulness can really help with that. I also help find with my clients, it helps them in pausing when they're triggered with a reaction and to develop that pause muscle to choose a response and have some separation on it. So uh, I've seen the impact for many people with this. And the one in the middle is spending time with family and friends. Abundant evidence on how that generates dopamine, endorphins, all these great chemicals that make us better and perform better at our job. These are investments in our ability to be resilient and do deep work on our job. The last thing before we get to some, uh, an exercise I, want, size I want you to uh, do and take away here is something we can do for each other. And that is simplify whatever we can. I'm looking at a lot of people who are in clinical roles or in clinical areas. By nature, you look at fine details because they're life and death. I totally get that. But I, most of my clients were healthcare clients, but I had clients in other industries. And I always noticed how complicated and more complicated processes were in healthcare. And it's the nature of how people think and how they approach things. But I'll never forget going out to a client I had in Lincoln, Nebraska. And Lincoln's not the kind of place that you can fly in and out of in one day. Um, you're you're going to get an early morning flight and maybe one at 8 at night. That's just the flight schedule from Chicago. So they wanted me to come out and facilitate a meeting in the morning. And I said to them, I go, you know, I, I, I'd have to charge you the whole day for that because I'll be out of pocket the whole day. And they go, that's OK. We, we like you to do that. So I get there. Now they're thinking, well, we paying for Keith. Let's have him do something else. So, the, <laughs> so there's a group that was studying a process and gathering of data that was provided in a report to their executives. And the, this uh, vice president of HR said, they're so dysfunctional. We hear screaming and yelling from the room. Can you just sit in 
and try to help calm them down and get to work together. I'm like, sure. And I go in this room, and really, it was like a Seinfeld episode. It was, it was bad at times. And about 15 minutes in, I said, just, I hate to ask a stupid question, but what is ever done and what actions ever taken as a result of this report? It was quieter than this room is right now. All right. No one over 10 years of doing it could think of anything that ever happened because of that data. So I said, stop it. Oh, no, we can't stop it. Everyone finds it very interesting. They look at it every month. Stop it. We as an industry are ferociously busy with hellacious change. And that's not a hump we're getting through. This is the industry. If there's stuff we can simplify or stop doing and nothing happens, we should give that gift to everyone that we work with. Now, on your seat, there is a piece of paper. There's two of them. But one of them is a list of all the uh, concepts that we talked about. And there's a check mark box on the right-hand side. What I'd like you to do is spend really quickly, first impressions, go through those and put a check mark next to anything you heard in this session that you think if you implemented for yourself would be helpful. Let's do that just in a couple minutes, all right? If you've completed your check marks, I'd like you to circle one or two at the most that you think would have the highest impact and be worthy of you focusing attention on building that habit over the next six weeks. So do that. The reason I suggested one or two is I spend my days and my career helping people change behavior. And if I had to redo my career again, I would have learned something that I learned later than I should have probably, <laughs> is that people can change maybe one or two behaviors at a time. And with the people I coach, I try to focus on a couple things at a time that we work at. So with that in mind, I'd like you to have this one or two things that you're going to focus on building a habit. It doesn't mean your other check marks you won't get to. But for six weeks or so, that you'll focus on that. I'd like you to turn to someone else in the room, partner up, and share what that is with that, per that person. So you're going to have to maybe move seats a little bit if you're like the two people here and Alone in the row? All right, why don't we come back together? And before you leave today, before you leave today, a few things. One, if you want credit um, for this, you've got to make sure you swiped in. You also need to fill out the uh, evaluation form. The other thing I'm going to suggest you do, the person you were just talking to, let me introduce you to your new time management coach. <laughs> All right? Here's what I've learned. If you want to build, how many anyone here run a marathon? I know there is. <laughs> and you hit that 20th mile, and it hurts, right? It's real. And really, for a lot of us, the only reason we finish is that we told people we're running the marathon, right? <laughs> When you make a commitment out loud to someone that you're going to change behavior, you increase the chances you're going to do it. And you really increase it if they're going to follow up every two weeks with you. So here's a suggestion. You exchange either extensions or email with the person you just talked to. And two weeks from now, you check in on how they're doing on building this habit. Let me also say, it, I'm looking at a lot of people that I, it would not be a huge leap for me to say there's probably some perfectionists in this room, because this building's loaded with them, right? <laughs> Here's the thing with being a perfectionist and building new habit. You'll give up faster than someone who's not, because you'll think, I just can't do this. I, this happens with everyone I coach practice as a perfectionist. All these physicians are. And it's getting them to realize you have good days, you have bad days. All right? So you'll try to build this habit, and it won't be like an on-off switch. And it won't even be like a straight line. It's going to be a jagged journey like this. But if you keep at it, and you accept the bad days where you don't do it right, and you relish the days you do it right, and you talk to this colleague you just met, and you do this for six weeks, eight weeks or so, it'll be a habit. 
then go back to that list and pull out one or two other check marks and work on those. So I greatly appreciate your time today. Uh, I know how valuable it is, obviously. <laughs> and I hope you found it valuable too. Thank you.